is perhaps one of the more vital of other publications. I've selected that for the present series. For historical orientation, the material was first distributed in the form of Letters and Lessons to Students about 1940. It first appeared in print in book form in 1942, therefore approximately 18 years ago. In the interval since the writing of the book, there have been many and marked changes in our way of life. And uh, looking back over the years and trying to estimate the changes, it still seems to me that the essential principles that set forth have not been changed or greatly modified by any of the so-called discoveries of science or by the elements of modern progress. We say this with full appreciation of the fact that any work done by a human being must be dated. No individual can possibly penetrate beyond the sphere of experience. Therefore, it is a mistake to assume that any writing is infallible. It relates to its own times and to the conditions that exist in those times. And its lingering validity depends upon the degree of a basic truth which is contained in the principal premises and objectives of a given work. I feel in this case that the book has a certain strength, having been derived from those sources of knowledge which have had undiminished authority for more than 2,500 years. We may outgrow many things, but we have not yet and will not outgrow the need for virtue, the need to develop integrities, or the pressing requirement for individual security in troubled times. These elements remain, and while they remain, philosophy and comparative religion uh, maintain the validity of their essential uh, points of view. The purpose of the book, very largely, was to meet what I believed at that time to be a basic need. There has always been, uh, in the West, a group of persons seriously desiring to advance consciousness through some form of organized program of study and discipline. And in this book we present what I feel to be a comparatively safe interpretation of certain established disciplines practiced among both Eastern and Western nations, but in their complete and original forms, not entirely practical to Western man. The human being must work against the reference frame of the conditions in which he finds himself. It is not reasonable or proper to demand that any person place himself in a situation in which he is at great personal disadvantage or to attempt procedures uh, which are not likely to succeed in the way of life with which he is most familiar. Our text, therefore, is concerned with a kind of yoga, a modification of East Indian philosophy strengthened and directed through the contributions of other Eastern schools and brought into Western focus by means of Platonism, Neoplatonism, and Gnosticism. Thus we feel that we have bridged the primary interval of learning, the interval which divides, naturally, Eastern and Western cultures. Eastern culture is essentially subjective. Western culture, essentially objective. This may not always remain the truth. There is a continual process in nature which tends to lead to an alternation of polarities among living things. It is therefore quite conceivable that in the course of time, Eastern civilization will become highly objective and that Western culture may in turn 
become more distinctly subjective. But modern man, living in our present century, and under the pressure of contemporary problems, still remains in the West essentially objective. Uh, when in doubt, he takes a rather aggressive point of view. He may very likely uh, strike out against circumstances with all the vitality and libido at his command. He is going to fight his way, work his way, struggle his way, or even talk his way through the various problems that arise. He therefore uses a tremendous amount of objective energy and has come to conclude that expenditure of energy is the essential ingredient in progress. There may be some doubt as to this. Certainly there is some grave question as to whether the individual can fight his way from ignorance to wisdom. This point of view then leads us to the need for Eastern subjective balance of thinking. The individual must be taught that the search for truth is not a competitive quest for success as we know such a questing in Western life. The search for improvement is a very much more subjective thing. And in order to succeed at all, it must be undertaken with a right kind of attitude. It must be approached not offensively or even defensively. It must be approached with a simple directness of action, which again seems strange to us. Western civilization has gradually deprived man of direct action. He may deny this, but actually he is continually conditioned. And whenever he feels the impulse to act in a direct manner, he begins also to sense reactionary cautions arising in his own temperament, warnings that direct action may lead to loss of social adjustment. In this book, therefore, we have attempted certain basic principles of yoga. But we have tried to also defend the student against the dangers of yoga for Western man. We have tried to point out, for example, uh, that the scientific aspect of self-development is not as yet suited to us. And since the uh, preparation of this book, we have had very strong support for this particular point of view. Western man, having become aware of the powerful instruments of knowledge, has already gravely endangered his own survival by his belief that scientific processes are legitimate and may be used regardless of moral consequences. The same thing that could happen and did happen in society in releasing upon us the dangers of what we now talk, call the atomic age is a good symbol of what might occur within us if we rely entirely upon a scientific approach uh, to the attainment of self-mastery. Theoretically, the West would like to approach the problem of man with complete scientific thoroughness. Actually, however, science without certain value controls without certain uh, background of culture can be, and usually is, extremely dangerous. In the East, where yoga or Zen or Taoism are prevalent beliefs, we have a culture that has been conditioned for ages, a long ways unfamiliar to us. In the first place, the great body of Eastern mankind has been unaware of what we term success and only slightly aware of what we call progress. Eastern man has not sought uh, the expansion of a way of life as we have in the West. Also from the earliest experience of Oriental history, Oriental culture, the religious factors have been vitally dominant. Eastern man has built his entire way of life 
upon a compliance with a pattern of universal principles. He has always regarded heaven as first. He has always been ready to sacrifice earth for heaven. He has always been ready to sacrifice wealth for interior uh, contemplation. He has been quick to renounce this world for the other. He has never felt the pressing need to compromise his spiritual principles for the advancement of his industrial or political states. Now, of course, this has its drawbacks. As a result of this attitude, Asia was for centuries uh, very tardy in its industrialism. It also suffered an almost unbroken sequence of bad government. It uh, lacked much of the improvement much of the scientific knowledge, medical knowledge, professional knowledge that we possess in our Western life. Having placed value where it believed value to belong, it willingly sacrificed for value. In our Western experience, value is now held largely in terms of objective success. Value means the security not of the soul, but of worldly adjustment. It means not that man becomes better, but that he becomes stronger. Not that he becomes necessarily wiser, but that he becomes more skillful. These differences affect our religious patterns. Western man is not conditioned for asceticism. He is not conditioned to take on, without modification, a way of life that has belonged to another people for thousands of years. We see an equally unfortunate situation when Eastern man suddenly tries to become westernized. The result is a very unhappy and uh, sometimes almost ridiculous situation. Uh, Eastern man has not the background uh, to take on uh, the perspectives and objectives of the West with its out, without at least a few generations of conditioning. Thus, in the East, Western practices and policies have led to great stress and to the disruption of the cultural life of the people. Our primary concern, then, is that the West is in need of a greater spiritual integrity. We need values. We see in the East certain monuments of these values. And let us again be quite fair about this. The term East is not synonymous with spirit, nor is it necessarily synonymous with value. When we speak of the East, we do not speak of a hemisphere populated with saints. We do not speak of a people faultless and utterly dedicated to their spiritual objectives. We speak, rather, of a polyglot, a people, many of them, not well oriented in their own beliefs, not free from selfishness or greed, not able to achieve world peace any more than we have in the West. Therefore, when we mean East, we mean, rather, the basic principles of Eastern philosophy, even as when we speak constructively of Christianity, we certainly do not speak of the clashing of 500 creeds. We speak rather of basic principles as taught by the Holy Nazarene along the shores of the Lake of Galilee. We speak of essentials. Now the essentials of the East have given us the basis of the yogic doctrine and several other important oriental schools. These values, I think, are somewhat more appreciated and more guarded and more respected in the East than parallel values of similar significance are respected in the West. But this is by degree only. It is not a clean-cut difference. It is not a difference of where one is all right and the other is all wrong. Thus the Oriental philosophy uh, uh, with which we are most concerned may be almost as strange to many Easterners as it is to us. I remember speaking on the problem of Oriental philosophy in the Albert Theatre, Calcutta. And after the talk, several Hindus 
uh, told me that they had no idea that these principles were in their own philosophy. Uh, thus, we cannot uh, be too sure of these things. Mahatma Gandhi had the same experience. He did not realize or understand the wealth of his own uh, cultural background until it was brought directly to his attention by English students in London. Thus, it isn't fair for us merely to assume that we must now uh, uh, acknowledge eternal gratitude to the East any more than we should neglect the West. The principle involved is one of earnest searching, a definite effort to discover what is valuable, and gradually to eliminate the concept of hemispheric difference as we now think of it today. We now think of Eastern wisdom and Western wisdom. Sometime we hope that we will think of the world's wisdom, the wisdom of all good persons, all dedicated human beings seeking better ways of life. The Western way as we know it centers around certain experiences. And one of these experiences is our own peculiar scatteredness. The average Western person is not self-disciplined. He is not able to control his own moods, even in lesser things, in the ordinary experiences of life. Probably the most controlled uh, person in the Western Hemisphere is the American Indian, who, uh, however, we scarcely regard today as uh, a proper source of spiritual instruction, although I'm inclined to think we're making a mistake. This point, however, is true, that we as a people are not self-disciplined. We are moved constantly by impulse. We know not the source of this impulse, nor the direction in which it is impelling us. We live a kind of day-to-day -day life hoping to get by, and hoping that we will have the skill to mo tomorrow to mend the errors of today. Instead of mending, however, this habit of disorganization generally results in the complete collapse of the fabric of our purposes. As a result of that, Western man does not have directives. He does not like to accept the directives of others. They seem to um, over-influence his individuality yet he exercises very little self-directive. Therefore, we have thought of this book of self-unfoldment in terms of an introduction to self-directiveness, uh, the means by which we will gradually and naturally come uh, to a stronger power to direct and control ourselves. To do this, we must practice certain world-established policies of discipline. Discipline is not a, an Eastern word, essentially. It is as commonly found among the Greeks. It is simply a term to indicate that the individual has taken hold of his own life, that he is not permitting uh, the uh, various instincts which constitute his personality to have sovereignty over the total pattern of his life purpose. He is learning, or must learn, through discipline, that it is not necessary to have a bad disposition, that it is not necessary uh, to be jealous, it is not necessary to hate people, it is not necessary to be selfish or self-centered or arrogant, it is not necessary to be afraid, nor to be a worrier, nor to be a gossip. These excesses we sort of sweep over us and take control of us so that uh, St. Paul says when we would do good evil is ever nigh unto us. This situation is not necessary. It is foolish and unreasonable to assume that man, the noblest creature that we know, has no way in which to polarize his own nobility that he has been given faculties and powers beyond those of any other creature visible to us in nature. These faculties and powers are not only sufficient to enable him to exist, they are sufficient to enable him to live well. Now many people 
when confronted with this problem of self-discipline, simply go to pieces. They are unable to handle uh, the basic elements of resisting an impulse which may arise within themselves. Why, possibly, has Asia a little better skill in this particular direction? Perhaps it is because Asiatic peoples have never enjoyed the security that Western man has known. Uh, material life in the East was never such a wonderful and many splendored thing that man could conceive of no better state. There was very little peace in the Eastern world any more than in the Western. The Eastern individual had to adjust himself to pressures which have generally relaxed among our people. He had to face changes, real, sometimes desperate. He had to depend more upon himself than upon the security of his culture. He never seems to have developed this attitude of blaming his politicians for what was wrong with him. He has never sensed that other people could give him a good world. He took the world with a strange, almost animal-like simplicity. This is the way it was. This is the way it is. And in this world, as it is, each individual must do his best. Now, we take the world somewhat as it is. In fact, we are getting a little fatalistic about it at the moment. But it has never really come home to us that we do not need to be victims of the world, that it is not necessary for us to go along miserably day after day complaining about everything and feeling that our complaints are justified and our situation is hopeless simply because we are unable to control the conduct of half or three quarters of a billion other human beings. Eastern man never had that attitude. It has never occurred to him that his happiness was dependent upon good government or that his security was dependent upon high wages and organized labor. These things might be nice. They might give him, perhaps, in the end, the same attitude we have. But he never got that far. He was never in a position to worry about what he had the way we do. His major worry was about what he did not have. Today, we are the victims of our possessions. And in, the, in this uh, philosophy, we have come to, con to regard our material state as being so important that its mistakes are fatal even as its advantages are beneficial. So we live in a world of powerful extremes which pull us back and forth and a world in which there seems to be a legitimate reason why everyone should be unhappy. Well, perhaps there is, but to the Eastern mind this would not be interpreted in this way. Unhappiness would be regarded as a direct personal challenge. The individual who is unhappy would say to himself in Asia, what have I done that is wrong? Over here, the same individual would explain in a long, involved manner what is wrong with everyone else and why he cannot be happy because his friends, relatives, neighbors, family, and enemies are all operating contrary to his inclinations. This type of difference uh, is very clear and very definite. And toward this, our idea of a book de dedicated to the principle of self-discipline has uh, seemed to be good. Now, if we were in Asia working on the problem of self-discipline, it would be comparatively simple. A guru would say to his disciples, sit there for five years and don't move till I tell you to, and he would be there for five years. In this country, it would seem a very difficult situation because who will pay the taxes? Uh, also, if in the East a disciple was told to practice a certain attitude for five years or ten years, he would do so without question. Today, we will do nothing without question in the West. And much of our questioning is in the simple and solid hope that we are going to be able to question our way out of any effort on our own part, that we want to explain why anything we do not like is wrong. 
Anything we do not want to do is unnecessary. If we try to follow, therefore, all of these eastern paths of, me of mystical growth, we would probably end in a very antisocial situation. We would be forced to make decisions primarily unreasonable and unfair to other people. Here's another strong situation that has to be faced. In the Orient, particularly where philosophic principles uh, dominate, families are united in these principles. All members of the family have the same basic belief and the same basic acceptance of value. If, for example, a householder in India should decide to take upon himself the holy life and go out to become a recluse in the mountains, there would be no question as to the importance and the rightness of his doing so. His family and friends, his children, would beg him to do that which he believed to be right. Here such an action would be regarded as little better than an evasion of family responsibility. The question would arise, who will support who? This question does not arise where all members of the family regard the holy life as the most important and distinguished of all things. One way or another, the family would unite its resources and carry on. There would never be a question about this. It would not be an eccentric thing. It would not be an evasion, it would be an acceptance. And it would be held firmly and strongly that those left behind and thrown upon heavier responsibilities would be themselves most fortunate inasmuch as their own opportunity to grow through adjustment would be increased or enlarged. Thus it would seem that in the West such a pattern would certainly not be acceptable. Nor is it acceptable for an individual who has established a way of life in the West to attempt to advance his own spiritual destiny with total disregard for those around him. There may be uh, evidence in the dialogues of Buddha that the individual so doing has performed a virtue, but in the West it would not be a virtue. It would mean a shattering of a situation and the forcing upon other persons of responsibilities for which they are not prepared and for which uh, possibly they have no inclination. Thus in the West the householder's position is different, the scholar's position is different, the scientist, the physician's position is different. All of these differences have to be taken into consideration, otherwise what we term religion would become a disintegrating force in society. It was perhaps in this emergency also that we found coming in Asia the rise of the second great age of Buddhistic thinking which was introduced about the beginning of the second century AD by the Arhat Nagarjuna. This was a modification of Buddhist philosophy and this modification finally influenced practically all of the religious philosophies of Asia. It was the modification of the individual growing without excessive attitude or action growing and unfolding without violent renunciations, growing and unfolding by working through the places he occupies rather than attempting to shift the pattern of life. In other words, the virtue or merit as it was called in Buddhism was to be gained not only by devoting one's life to the spiritual abstractions but could equally be gained by the unselfish dedication of one's life to the common service of the needs of others. Thus growth was no longer a solo flight to nirvana. Growth became a dedication, an achievement through renunciation, the individual accepting the burden with a new internal understanding. This is applicable to Western man. The uh, realization that the individual can attain a high degree of self-discipline and by this means an important major growth in the unfoldment of his internal life without becoming unadjusted, without departing from those patterns of responsibility which he has properly and reasonably accepted and which having accepted he is under duty 
uh, to fulfill. This uh, Mahayana or Northern Buddhistic uh, innovation uh, gave the Eastern world a tremendous step forward, making possible more progress, more development on a physical level than had previously been conceivable. It also taught us the importance that Socrates uh, also emphasized so definitely. He was asked once where the best place to study was, and he answered immediately, the place where you are. Here is the place of learning. Here is the situation which invites to discipline. Here are all the inducements of growth. Here is the important but complicated schoolroom through which we are supposed to learn all those lessons necessary for the integration of our inner lives. This, in a sense, makes more reason than perhaps our modern psychological attitude. For our psychological attitude has just a little of Brahmanism in it. In psychology today, the individual struggling for normalcy breaks all patterns, or many patterns, in the effort to regain his own integration. If a situation is bad, break it up, walk out of it, leave it behind. The Western physician is not at all sure that Western man is strong enough to work out a problem. More likely, he must walk out of the problem. Also in psychological thinking, uh, the effort to achieve integration becomes a selfish uh, project in a great many cases. It must be attained at the expense of something or someone. Eastern philosophy, particularly the Mahayana, uh, indicates that growth is a personal thing. But it is the kind of a personal thing which, if properly administered, will never result in loss or pain to another person. That like spiritual wealth, which can be accumulated without causing others to be poorer, true grace of spirit, true inward life, does not require the help of our neighbors or our friends, nor does it mean that we should withhold any normal or reasonable help from them, or to advance our ways in conflict with their uh, convictions about what is right. These processes are so quietly and internally uh, firm that the individual can grow without hurting others. This point was a perhaps a little more consequence in 1940 than it is to many people of today, because many of, the, of you who will remember those years remember the extravagant efforts that were being made by religious groups in the United States uh, to attempt a condition of spirituality. The, the, the search uh, for truth was almost fanatical. Uh, the individual pressed on regardless of his own capacities or his own abilities and totally ignoring his own debilities. To him, truth was a mysterious something that lay just beyond his reach, something he must struggle for. And he also had a, an optimism that somewhere someone would tell him about it, particularly at a reasonable remuneration. Thus, the schools and groups sprang up. I remember one group that had as its immediate goal the full and complete understanding of the Absolute. Uh, this was not thought of in terms of growth. It was thought of in terms of a trick of the mind, an attitude by means of which suddenly all ignorance was dispelled. This group did very well in its own way. Of course, no one ever achieved the promised end. But the average person didn't know whether he'd achieved it or not, as he had no comprehension of either the finite or the infinite. But uh, in the terms of these competitive uh, spirituality of the day, uh, this particular group immediately uh, developed uh, a split within itself, and a second group came into existence out of this one, proceeding further under the glowing title, The Absolute Absolute. And this went on, 
uh, to infinity ad nauseum. There was no end to it. No one ever got there. But everyone was quite certain that some uh, extraordinary state was available to them simply because they were citizens of the Western Hemisphere or had m sufficient money in their bank account. This situation has somewhat cleared, but every once in a while we see a, a sad case of reaction. Actually, we still are a little optimistic, uh, but uh, many years of disillusionment has tempered our hopes. We are beginning to sense that whatever this thing is that man needs, this inner truth that he requires, is not going to be quickly attained. It is something that he must labor for, and his growth will be measured in the terms of the intelligent discipline with which he directs his own life. Now discipline may itself need a moment of definition. A discipline is an action or a controlling by the will. It is the individual asserting value over impulse. The individual perhaps depends upon his conscience to determine that which shall be the directive of his discipline. But when every person in the presence of that which is not right strongly resolves to cling to the right, he has exercised a measure of self-discipline. The fullness of this discipline, of course, depends upon his understanding of right. The more he knows, the better his discipline can be. But knowledge does not necessarily result in discipline. Knowledge can be abstract. An individual can intellectually comprehend many things and live as a badly undisciplined person. Therefore, knowledge, wisdom, or understanding have little value unless they contribute to the individual's direction of his own conduct. This is the point that Plato so clearly makes that no wisdom, no learning is valid unless it is proven or demonstrated by its effect upon conduct. Unless we become better, we are not better. Unless our ability to control negatives and sustain positives increases, there is no indication that our religions or our philosophies or our arts are meaningful to us. An individual can study music and he may become informed as a musicologist. Uh, but for most people, the proof of his musical knowledge is his ability uh, to exhibit that knowledge uh, by an adequate technique in vocal or instrumental music. Thus, unless our impulses, our desires, our convictions lead us to the disciplines, as in arts or sciences, by which we become capable of using knowledge, of transforming ideas into impulses which may impel us to years of discipline or disciplined exercise. Until such discipline sets in, there is no movement within the consciousness. There is no essential change in the substantial nature of man. So disciplines have to be, but they must also be with a minimum of effort. And one of the points that is clear in all Eastern philosophy, and which we have tried to make very clear in this book, is the idea of effortless effort. Western man measures effort actually in terms of ergs of energy. If he is violently active, he is busy. Whether he is doing anything or not is not important. We, we seem to feel uh, that if we see a man straining to the last ounce of his strength, that this individual is really giving everything he has. He may be, but he doesn't have very much, because this kind of exhibition is not solutional, except perhaps if he be a professional weightlifter. Outside of this, uh, there is not much to be gained. Effortless effort is the Eastern way of approaching this tremendous sense of difficulty with which we have always um, surrounded the concept of growth. The moment we speak of growth or of discipline or of 
of philosophical development, we sort of sense a long, gray-bearded schoolmaster with a willow switch in one hand, uh, demanding that we produce our lessons and have them right, and punishing us for the slightest misdemeanor. In other words, discipline reminds us of school, and the moment we get out of school, we do not wish to be reminded of it again. So discipline has become a bad word. It has become almost as nasty a word as philosophy. It seems to represent hard work with very little profit. It suggests a kind of individual who is willing to dedicate his life to non-profitable uh, enterprises and therefore may die a little better but much poorer, which is considered to be a very serious disaster. In the East, the whole theory of discipline lies in the fact that no energy is required. The reason why we have to use energy in discipline at the present time is because the will, the energy factor, is itself divided. We are giving more will energy to our desire than we are to the impulse to control that desire. Thus, two streams of will come head-on into collision. And whichever will is the stronger will ultimately uh, vanquish the other. The question is, is the will of what we should do greater than the will of what we want to do, but which we know perhaps isn't the best? To fight out this to Western man is a great moral issue. It is a little uh, like old St. Jerome wrestling with the devil. It gets to be a, a really a conflict. It becomes almost a mortal battle between uh, the strength of our desires and the comparative weakness of our convictions. As long as the will is thus internally divided, we are not going to accomplish very much. Every time we desire in one direction, a counteraction of the will will arise. Whenever we decide to be especially good, the desire to be not so good is also strong. In the Eastern philosophy, the answer lies in the simple unity of the will principle. The will must move in one direction. The moment this unity of will is achieved, the individual is no longer subject to this tremendous discord. So the East divides the will into two terms or concepts, divine will and human will, or divine purpose and human purpose. Unless the individual uh, addicts himself completely to one or the other, there must be conflict. If he addicts himself, however, entirely to human purpose, experience proves that he has a bad time, because these purposes are not sufficient, and the human nature is not wise enough uh, to lead its own compound to a state of security. Thus, the sacrifice of control usually leads to excess. On the other hand, the higher will nature of man depends for its power and authority upon philosophy, upon wisdom, upon an internal conviction about reality. The moment conviction becomes stronger than doubt, the power of the will is no longer in conflict with itself. Thus, in the Eastern concept of discipline, there is really no effort at all. It is merely a gradual education of what man wants to do. And when he wants to do that which is next and necessary, he does it without stress or effort. The only reason why we have trouble in growing is because there is something in us that does not want to grow. And that something is either selfishness or laziness. And uh, opposed by this static, we have to use more dynamic than is necessary or proper to almost any project. And as we go through the book, some of these points were made clear. This, I think, represents the basic argument of the book. Namely, that there is not only the possibility of discipline, the need for it, that it is rewarded by a certain extension of inner ability. 
that the disciplined person, having fulfilled certain simple uh, laws and rules of conduct, finds an internal available, becomes more and more aware of the basic realities within himself. And from these basic realities, he gains a continually increasing and enlarging power uh, toward the final achievement of his own integration. And he does this in a simple and direct manner, without any obvious symbolism, without any violent, tempestuous struggles, and very far from the Western concept that man must be forever locked in a deadly war with sin. And the Eastern idea of sin is quite different. Sin to the East is simply weakness. And uh, you can't fight weakness, because if you have anything to fight it with, you are strong. And where strength is, there is no weakness. The only reason why weakness wins is because no strength is exercised. And what we term sin to Eastern thinking is the individual simply failing to be himself. And as a result of this failure, involving himself in a series of situations which endanger his happiness, his security, and perhaps even his life. On these principles, then, we have tried to outline a simple uh, textbook for thoughtful persons. And in honor of certain Eastern ideas, we have inserted here and there, through the text, groups of fables. Fables being, in a sense, a wonderful way of teaching. These fables are mostly mystical legends which have enriched the literature of Eastern peoples. The wonderful power of the fable lies in its fantasy, and that this fantasy can strike directly into the emotional psychic content of man. If argument and discussion reach the mind, fable seems to strike into the emotional center of the individual. Fables are either pathetic, or they are happy, or they are gracious, or they tell us stories which move us. They cause us to select heroes and heroines and to feel a certain um, antagonism to villains and uh, other disruptible characters. The fable gives us an emotional warmth. It causes us to feel something rather than to merely think. This is another strong point in Eastern wisdom. The importance of man's feelings as guides and leaders to conduct. If the internal life of the individual is warm, in rich, beautiful feeling, he has another powerful defense against that which is unworthy of him. He finds certain emotional strength, the strength of his inner affections, his regards, his venerations. These things he gains courage from. They help him, in moments of stress, to do the thing which is beautiful, to cling to that which is fine, or gracious, or proper, as the Chinese might call it. So in the fables, we have little stories about big problems. And these little stories help us to realize that big problems are really little, and that we have falsely magnified them. So between the allegory, the symbol, the fable, and the instruction, we hope that a certain insight will be gained, an insight which will enrich uh, the person in a moderate, natural, relaxed, orderly improvement of himself. All things done graciously and kindly, without even spiritual ambition, but with this wonderful sense of adjustment to a life that is larger than our own. If we can achieve this sense of adjustment, much that is good will be attained. Now there are certain sections in the book, and I have marked a few of them for little special consideration this evening, things where it seems to me uh, we can gain, perhaps through a little further insight. Naturally, in the course of time, we are bound 
to reflect upon some of these problems. And it would be foolish indeed uh, to deny that probably the wording could be improved, that uh, actually uh, many of these ideas could be enriched. I do not think, however, that this is a desperate situation. I think perhaps it does, however, invite us to just such a group of studies as those we are beginning tonight, simply because we can span perhaps 18 years of study and thought and bring these definitions a little more clearly into focus. Uh, the very beginning of the book deals with what we term theories of discipline. I uh, cannot this evening give you page numbers in every case, but maybe later I'll try and do so, inasmuch as my marked copy of this book is from a different setting published in London. Therefore, uh, you will find it word for word the same, but I'm not sure that the pagination is identical. But in the very beginning of the first section, we give definitions of three processes uh, or disciplines of ancient religion. And I think these offer us further food for contemplation. We contrast or attempt to distinguish clearly between meditation, realization, and illumination. We point out that meditation is a contemplation of divine realities through a certain internal discipline of insight. Uh, meditation naturally must be without tension or effort. Meditation is actually this very concept of be still and know. Thus meditation is not an aggressive discipline. Meditation is not a search for something. It is not a conjuring up of anything within the consciousness of the individual. Nor is it an effort by the mind or by the consciousness to impose its own convictions upon a mystical reverie. The great danger that confronts the average Western student of meditation is that he is meditating from a conviction instead of toward one. He is using certain familiars in their accepted and familiar way. Therefore, it is very easy for meditation to simply become a psychological a reinforcement of attitudes held to be true. This is why, perhaps, uh, even in uh, 1940, when it was comparatively unknown in this country, we brought in uh, considerable material bearing upon Zen. Because in Zen we have perhaps uh, the very uh, substance of the meditative uh, concept. It is in meditation not what we meditate upon, but the level of what we meditate with that is of the greatest significance. Uh, the Eastern mystic takes for granted that in every person and in every being there is the substratum of the eternal mind or of the eternal life. This has its own nature. Uh, to meditate therefore upon uh, the nature of being is much as though we were looking out upon a great sunset from a mountain or across a great scene stretching out uh, like perhaps uh, one of the beautiful paintings of the Chinese Taoist mystics. Meditation is man's becoming capable of acceptance, is becoming capable of so reducing the human equation in his own nature that he becomes aware of the divine equation. Theoretically, in meditation, if the person can completely eliminate himself, he will then become completely reality conscious. This uh, is a little difficult, perhaps, for Western people to think about 
and I've heard people wonder whether they could safely afford to eliminate themselves. Their friends thought they could, but they, the individual himself was not quite so certain. Actually, I don't believe that we need to be too fearful about this discipline developing over rapidly. I don't think there is any danger of the individual wiping himself off uh, as a chalk mark on a wet slate. Uh, actually, all of these achievements are highly relative. Buddha, however, pointed out that even the smallest step in the direction of reality is accompanied by a certain enlargement of reality. As we approach it, it seems to approach us. And somewhere in this mutual approachness of things, we come finally to an identity. By meditation, therefore, by degrees, we eliminate error. We become quiet. The purpose, the discipline leading to meditation is the one of controlled relaxation. Now this is a particularly valuable to us now because of the tremendous tension of Western man. I think we may say, as Eastern and Zen scholars have pointed out, that 15 minutes of adequate meditation will relieve the individual of all of the tensions of a busy day because meditation is a complete rest. Rest is not achieved through the ceasing of labor. Rest is, re is the result of the ceasing of conflict. And in the individual whose life is made up of a series of conflicting factors, whether he works or plays, whether he is busy or attempting to do nothing, the conflict continues. The conflict in human temperament continues until it is solved. It will never solve itself. It will never end because we change the situations in which we live. Uh, the conflicts may change with situation, but the principle of conflict will not cease until the individual achieves the discipline of meditation. The discipline of meditation is one expression of the power of the person over himself. Expression. <laughs> this is the common state of man. This is the Eastern fable. The simple little story which brings a tremendous fact home, whereas a thousand words would not be as good as this one picture. But we are all, to a degree, like this old man, firmly believing that it is our sovereign right to carry the horse. We have always done it. We have carried the body as we would the horse. We have never assumed that we should ride it. We have never assumed that it should serve us. Its pleasure becomes our law and our necessity. But sometimes, some way, man must learn to break the horse. As in the uh, Taoist analogy or the Zen analogy of the ten bulls. We must gradually achieve victory over this animal personality which has become the heartless taskmaster, the absolute autocrat of our living. If, however, we finally can break the horse by one real and strenuous effort, we then come into a close camaraderie with the horse. And the well-trained horse is perhaps happier and more fortunate than in any other condition. Its friendship for the man who has mastered it becomes real and enduring. And yet, when it was broken, it fought for its liberty with everything that it had. In the same way, the human being, coming into a rational relationship with body, does not destroy body, but enriches it gives it purpose, gives it fulfillment, gives it wisdom and care that the body will never have while the body alone attempts to dictate its own future. So man, in meditation, is, so to say, in the Zen allegory, learning to ride his own horse. He is learning 
the simple relationships between consciousness and body. And he is finally learning that these relationships can be pleasant, that they can be better, more happy, and that every factor involved is improved as a result of this achievement. But whereas breaking the horse is a symbol of a very violent action, the Zen discipline is violent only in terms of how we would think it to be. We can't imagine any exertion greater than self-control. And we assume that we must gather ourselves up and become dragon slayers in order to overcome our own temperaments. Thus the achievement seems incredible. But actually, in meditation, we find it extremely simple. It is quite simple to let go. In fact, we let go every night when we go to sleep. And if we do not let go, we have a bad night. Thus, in sleep, we peacefully, happily, and optimistically give up our prejudices, our hates, our fears, and our doubts, and rest ourselves in the comfort of comparative not knowing, fully convinced that in the morning we will wake up with fresh energy with which to make new mistakes. <laughs> Meditation is therefore a kind of waking sleep. It is the individual attaining freedom without unconsciousness, gaining the power to rest without first blocking every faculty of his consciousness in order to do so. This is not necessary. Man can rest awake. He can rest with his consciousness quietly and smoothly functioning. He can also suspend these functions almost totally until with this effortless effort the individual can experience the mystery of passing through what the old Zen calls the gateless gate. The door between two states of being that is no door at all, but is simply quietude. For in the quietude, the individual experiences this understanding, this inner mystery of meditation. And as the Lord walked in the garden in the cool of the evening, so in the quiet coolness of the collected light, man becomes aware. He is not even dogmatically interested in what he becomes aware of. He is not demanding awareness of this belief or proof for that idea. In meditation, he is simply accepting. He is permitting the infinite to move in its own infinite way. And this is a very wonderful experience. Now some people make their mistakes, as this book points out, in trying to meditate morning, noon, and night. This is not the purpose of the discipline. The purpose of this discipline is that the individual shall have interludes, perhaps very brief interludes, interludes which become a dynamic kind of prayer. We do not necessarily feel that we must pray from morning till night because we know in our better philosophy that our own conduct, hour by hour, is a continual living prayer, if it is right. But for a few moments, five, ten minutes a day, we seek this re-identification with the essential fact. And through this identification, we have the courage. We have the quiet sense of value by which we can live the rest of the time with a good hope, with understanding, with tranquility and peace, and also with a higher measure of conduct because we have experienced beyond our previous state. So it is this quietude which simply lets the universe move through us, react upon us, but it is not negative because it asks nothing, it demands nothing. It does not make itself an open hole in space. It simply relaxes personal tension in order that impersonal value may arise in consciousness and be accessible to us at any time. We are not seeking communion with the dead. We are seeking communion with the life that is within us. And out of this communion is our hope of additional strength and integrity. Now the second of our disciplines that we mention here 
is the discipline of realization. Now, the very word realization means or implies something more active. To realize something is to suddenly become aware of it. Or realization may mean awareness of values that we have not previously known or recognized. Or realization of better meaning than we have formally held to be associated with an idea, a circumstance, or an object. In our discussion, uh, we mention realization here is, this, uh, is the simultaneous understanding and acceptance of the divinity and the divine purpose in all things. The acceptance of the things as they are. But now, this is not merely quietude. It is acceptance in a sense, but it is a process of acceptance. The individual has the right to accept or reject. And acceptance now is a kind of highly suspended activity. It is an activity by which we make a moral choice or a decision involving value. We are constantly confronted with ideas which we either accept or reject. We are constantly in the presence of values which we weigh and analyze. But what we are trying to do with the discipline of realization is to become aware of meaning, to become aware constantly of our own power to ascertain or to penetrate into meaning. Realization, perhaps in its simplest form, is our ability to rise above the tendency to accept appearances or to judge things only from their surfaces and their outward parts. Realization also is a very wonderful thing in education, inasmuch as it becomes a natural hunger for meaning, so that instead of thinking of dates and places and wars and generals and statesmen, realization seeks to arrange these elements to discover value. What are the meanings? What have we learned? What has the world gained? What has human consciousness experienced through these various vicissitudes of life? Therefore, history becomes valuable as a record of the unfolding of energy content, the direction of human decision, uh, the pressures that have influenced mankind. Uh, realization, therefore, is forever seeking meaning. Thus, this, es uh, this, le uh, this exercise can be somewhat more broadly diversified and applied at other times. Realization should become an automatic, ever-present help in time of trouble. Realization is the remedy for superficial reaction to circumstance. Realization causes also things that seemingly are only annoyances or interruptions or trivialities uh, to suddenly indicate meaning. And uh, realization, of course, has a tendency to reduce our tendency to condemn, to criticize, to reject. It ends this highly Aristotelian polarization of so and not so. It causes us to be more patient, more considerate, and to search under action for its motives, for its lesson for us. The end of realization, therefore, as a technique, may be that we survey all existence and ask ourselves the simple question, what does this mean to me? How will it help me to grow? And how will it help me to become a better servant of the need of mankind? a better parent, a better husband, a better friend? How will it help me to guard against the intrusion of false opinion by which I may be deceived or deceive others and thus open my way uh, to the most serious and unhappy consequences? Realization deepens. It also takes the edge off of unreasonable action. The more we realize, the less dogmatic we are, the less aggressive we are. Therefore, many people in the West feel that this is a poor exercise. 
inasmuch as it takes away the sharpness of our own willingness to live and die for what we think. But unfortunately, up to now, we have only died for what we think. And the living part has not been especially favorable. So in this realization, then, we seek value, and the ultimate realization is, of course, the realization of the imminence of a divine plan, that all things that appear and manifest themselves exist only because they have a root in an eternal reality. Therefore, in some way, by their manifestation, by their expression, they reveal something of that which we can know. The science accepts certain measure of this in its doctrine of definitions by which we come to know things by what they do. And if we are able to use the realization principle accurately, phenomena in all its forms reveals its own noumenal source. And when we see something, we become aware of the processes behind it rather than the mere object itself. Realization, then, is the experiencing through of the illusion of appearances and the subtle instinctive questioning and questing of the realities which lie beneath all things as they seem to be. Thus, we are really using certain faculties of our own. We are not simply depending. We are questing. The realization is a rather suspended uh, but motivated, constant searching for the divine in the universe. And if we have this mood, not aggressively, we're not out seeking God every minute. We are not seeking God in the sense of a being or a person at all. We are seeking the God principle as it is manifested through the God working, not only in our friend but in our enemy, not only in the people we like but the people we have never known. It helps us, therefore, to have a better orientation. And realization is this constantly sustained natural inquiry after truth. And if we can develop it, it will do us a great deal of good. Illumination is the third subject of definition here. And we say that it is a state of conscious at one with the universal principle, man's participation in truth. Illumination, therefore, is something uh, which the individual uh, cannot condition by his own efforts. Uh, man may build toward reality. He may pass through a series of disciplines by which he brings himself, perhaps according to his own estimation, into a highly adjusted state. But in this problem, his own estimation is unimportant. For when man approaches the quality of illumination, he must become completely dependent upon the eternal workings of divine law itself. Um, the hour no man knoweth. The individual cannot judge for the infinite. He cannot determine to what degree his own path has been correctly walked. He can only take faith in certain sincerities, dedications, and in the realization that he is following a path where many others have gone before him, that the end of this path has always been at one moment, an experience of participation in the identity of the divine nature. This experience comes, as Bemi, the German mystic, says, like a flash of lightning, perhaps even in a clear sky. It is a sufficient situation, having set itself by all the means in our power and means that are not in our power. And when the hour is right, when the condition is right, when the being is right, when the adjustments which we are, have attained are perhaps as perfect as we think they are, 
when everything is as it should be, there is this experience of participation in total value. The individual suddenly becomes at one with life. Obviously, an experience of this kind is handicapped or limited by the bodily dimension. Man's human body is not an instrument suited for such highly attenuated experience. Even the most subtle parts of the body, the brain and the nervous system, are not able to sustain this vibratory rate for any length of time. Uh, the window must open and close. The light must come, perhaps only in the instant, as in the flash of light in the closing and opening of a camera shutter. Yet in this instant, there is a total existence. And in the, this mystical experience or illumination, the individual becomes immediately aware of an eternal fact. The vision ceases, the heavens close, the light is darkened. But man can never forget that which he has actually experienced. All report and testimony can be ignored, but that which is experienced it is inevitably fixed in consciousness. Thus illumination, as Plotinus tells us, may be granted to a person only once in a lifetime, or perhaps not in this lifetime at all. Yet in its own readiness and in its own time, it becomes the final proof of the validity of discipline. It becomes the end toward which all discipline leads namely a total state of being capable of bearing the conscious experience of truth. This total state may be consumed in a few instants. We cannot sustain it. But this continuity is unimportant because once the total experience has flashed upon us, no other situation can ever uh, take away its validity. Illumination, then, is the natural end of mystical disciplines. But it is an end which must not be selfishly sought. It is an end that is self-working. And that which attempts to attain it will probably forever bar it. But that uh, which deserves it by the doing of other things will attain it in proper time. In a way, it is a little like happiness. The more we seek it, the more rapidly it escapes. But when we forget ourselves in doing other things that are right, we suddenly discover that we are happy. And in this uh, discovery of spiritual happiness, spiritual identity, which we call the cosmic experience or cosmic consciousness, uh, we achieve that which we have earned. And probably by the time we achieve it, we may have given up all hope of ever having it. But regardless of this, in our merit, nothing which we deserve can be kept from us. But nothing we, not, as we do not yet deserve can be bestowed upon us, either by our enthusiasm or our determination. All of these disciplines, therefore, have a common factor of relaxation, a common factor of acceptances, and a common dedication to the great spiritual truth that it is not our will, but the will of heaven that must be accomplished, otherwise nothing is accomplished. On another page of, of the work, in the first chapter also, there is a discussion of the problem of loneliness. Uh, we have an idea that the individual who starts out to be spiritual is gradually going to end up friendless. We also have a feeling uh, that spirituality is going to have a terrible cost that we must pay for being good by giving up everything we like. That some way, the way to God is a way of continuous sacrifice. Western man has made a fetish out of sacrifice. He has made it seem as though uh, our eternal salvation in the world to come is dependent upon our continuing misery in this sphere. Such an attitude is obviously ridiculous but it is still very strongly impressive. It gives us the concept that we must serve God by being miserable. 
Nature does not tell us this. Examples of life in other spheres of experience will not sustain such a concept. We cannot say that a flower is miserable because it grows, or a bird can only sing if it is tortured. These things are not true. Growth and life and unfoldment are the natural things of nature. Certainly all growth has certain growing pains. These pains are pains of adjustment. But it is not growth per se that must lead to misery. It is man's interpretation of growth. It is a traditional point of view that has been built into his subconscious until he believes that through self-sacrifice, misery, resignation to disaster, he is really developing a godly nature. Actually, loneliness, or the sense of aloneness in our search for greater experience of truth, is due to certain deficiencies in ourselves. Actually, we are alone if our allegiances are divided. The individual who wants a condition which he has partly outgrown, but also wants a better condition which he has not yet attained, uh, can be on the horns of a dilemma. Mostly we find the so-called unhappiness attendant upon efforts to improve, simply due to wrong method. The individual has, has forgotten that growth is a reasonable process. He is trying too hard. He is trying to be too critical of his own conduct. He is making himself do things he does not really want to do or he is half-heartedly dedicated to some nobler concept of life. This type of situation is quite prevalent among organizations in which the membership, derived from many sources, may be united in a common purpose, but the individuals making up the memberships have different degrees of growth and allegiance. And in trying to keep the rules of their fraternity, they become utterly unadjusted and miserable because these rules are not really for them at this particular time. The person who finds that growth is making him uncomfortable is simply not ready for that kind of growth or else he is under wrong instruction. What he must realize is that growth is not the spearheading of a single virtue. It is not the individual trying very hard to attain some one thing and leaving the rest of his nature utterly uncultured. That is why we make such an emphasis here, perhaps more than some people think is necessary, of the importance of cultural growth along with other endeavors. The person who tries to be overwhelmingly good, moving desperately to what he believes to be a spiritual state, will usually be in trouble. He's in trouble because he has no supporting instruments. He wants to be very, very good, and yet most of his appetites are still bound to another kind of life. Now, he is not a sinner because he has these older attachments. He is simply uncomfortable because he has not adequately outgrown them. He is trying to cast them off without ever having actually transmuted them in his own conduct. So if we find that we're getting antisocial, if we can't get along with people, and one of the most common complaints that comes to me on this is typical of it, namely that it's more and more difficult as one person and a hundred more like them uh, have pointed out to me, it's so difficult for the spiritual person to get along in this horrible materialistic atmosphere. Uh, people are just not suitable for friends. They don't have the same lofty instincts. They don't have the same uh, spiritual interests. And this goes on and on and on until we can soon understand why the individual is totally alone. No one wants to hear this any longer. <laughs> this is not true spirituality and never can be. We are point, it was pointed out to us in the New Testament that Jesus lived in the homes and ate and worked with the 
sinner and the unregenerate. It isn't necessary for the individual uh, to uh, feel that he's alone in the world simply because he has achieved a certain sense of smug internal spiritual ex as achievement and is therefore a little better clay or perhaps not clay but a little better uh, psychic integration than those around him. This is foolish. It will naturally make us very uncomfortable because it is nothing but metaphysical snobbery at best. The simple fact is that realization will teach us, as Emerson le learned in a very simple manner, that there isn't a human being in the world who cannot teach us something. We don't outgrow other people. What we must outgrow is our own tendency to try to put them on levels of consciousness beneath our own. Work with them, understand them, share their interests, and you may discover that they will bring into focus neglected phases of your own experience. And uh, the real level of our understanding we meet, not merely upon the level of this desperate effort to be spiritual. We meet upon the common natural effort to be better. Therefore, cultural achievement is very important. As we love music, as we love art, as we express our refinements uh, through appreciation for the good in others, for their achievements, we can go and we can listen to the small child who play the scales on the piano, and instead of being spiritually disconsolate because of the inharmonies, we can suddenly develop a tremendous spiritual regard. We can begin to estimate the difficulties, the struggle of this child, and we're with them every minute. They do not have to be of one level or another uh, to be friendly, to be understood, and to give us association, friendship, and understanding. Frequently, we learn the most from those most different from ourselves. It is the heart in us that makes us willing to learn, to love to learn, and be ever grateful for the numerous experiences that come to us from different levels. These are the attitudes which help to keep us right. And with such attitudes, this problem of isolation does not come in. We may say that some people are not suitable, but it is not because of our spiritual problem that they are not suitable. The unsuitable person would also be unsuitable to us if we did not have any specific spiritual aspirations. It is not due to this spiritual aspiration problem. It is simply due to the fact that some people have in their way of life interests, attitudes, addictions which are strange to us and which we feel no need for. These people perhaps are not for us at the moment, but they are also not for us to condemn. But if we have enough interest in our spiritual questing, if we are well-balanced people, we will never be alone because there will be enough diversity of our eagerness that there are bound to be persons in our world from whom we can learn and with whom we can share. It is when we have this one-pointed drive merely to become spiritual ourselves that we can be very lonely. But this is a loneliness due to the fact that we have isolated our own condition and falsely estimated it. Otherwise, this state of things would not be a reality for us, and certainly not a desperate one, as it is in a great many cases. Now, at the end of the first chapter, uh, we begin a series of realizations uh, with which uh, these lessons are um, supplied. There is an appendix in the form of a realization in each of these lessons. And these realizations are things which we seek, more or less, to understand, not in the common sense of intellect, but in the more uncommon sense of taking them into a quietude and feeling them, not merely thinking them through. Now, in this quietude in which we feel them, there are two different types of quietude that may be developed. 
One is the actual quietude of the quiet room, the quiet chair in the corner, the soft light of evening. Here we can muse upon the mysteries of life. There is also the kind of quietude that comes perhaps in a more busy association, a quietude in which an all-pervading silence is not available. This is a quietude of the suspension of decisions, the suspension of attitudes, and the effort to experience in a more congested area, perhaps on the streetcar or the bus going home, or waiting in an office, or almost anything, that we become aware of the interpenetration of worlds, that we become aware of the nearness of that value which we've always regarded as more or less distant. And in the first realization, we have uh, the discipline of the individual reaching out toward the universalization of his own consciousness. Here we have the problem of the person beginning to realize, as he can and as he may, and according to the growing faculties which he possesses, this, uh, this mystery, not only he is not alone, not only can he never be alone, but more than this, he is not only a living thing, he is life. Actually, in the root of things, life is not similar or parallel, it is identical. And the search for universalization causes us to reach out into the common values of things. There is no fact, really, in our happiness. There is a fact only in happiness, uh, which we may share with everything that lives in as much as happiness is available to life. Happiness universally available is like fire, universally available but only manifested when flint and steel are brought together or the match is struck. Thus, universality is the absolute identity of all life and the fact that gradually it is possible for the human being to experience life beyond his own. This experience at first is theoretical. Later it is sentimental. Still later, perhaps, it is intellectual. But ultimately, as the results of the disciplines of yoga, it is factual. It is the gradual recognition that we are not friends, we are not brothers, we are not relatives, we are not strangers, we are not foes, we are one being. And because of certain lockness of insight, we have permitted this sense of oneness to be destroyed by the dividing elements of body uh, reflex. By sensory perceptions we are divided. By interior experience of consciousness we are united. This is at first a highly theoretical point, there is no doubt about that. But it has certain practical values both mystically and philosophically. For example, it gives us a certain mental or rational orientation. It gives us the gradual uh, resolution, strengthening through time, uh, to eliminate the concepts of difference, to eliminate most of the unpleasant uh, com conflicts which arise from our acceptance of the fact of difference. Religious differences are dissolved in religious fact. Racial differences are dissolved in humanity as one creation. As all forms of so-called inequality are finally reconciled in that quality which is the root of all things. And we are in the same position that Max Muller was in 
in the religious level when he said there never was a false religion unless a child is a false man. Thus, all things are the degrees of one thing. And to become aware of this is to let down certain resistances and to instinctively support in nature all processes which move toward unity and to remove our support from all things which divide, segregate, or result in the mutual criticism or condemnation one person of another. So in this first realization we seek to experience something more of the fact of one God manifesting as one life through one creation. That this creation may be infinitely diversified within itself we accept. But this diversity does not destroy unity, but takes place within unity. So that things, many of them apparently different, are like the leaves, twigs, and branches of a tree rising from one root and supported by one trunk. All life is one life. All mind is one mind. All soul is one soul. And from this we come into a new relationship with life. A relationship that is not biological, but is truly spiritual. We do not expect to perfect such a realization immediately. But in the course of time we may be able to perfect it. Now in the days when this book was first written, we had quite a group of people who were much concerned over the problem of karma. So I'd like to bring out just a few more reflections dealing with that theme. Karma was to the Oriental philosophy the idea of the inevitable relationship between sowing and reaping. The individual must think that all action leads to a compensatory reaction in nature. And we are also warned in many works relating to metaphysical things that the moment an individual tries to live better he is confronted with a load of old karma and life becomes well nigh impossible. Well there probably is a certain amount of truth in this concept but I think we have misunderstood and perhaps my own understanding has enlarged on this point since the time the book was written. The facts remain essentially the same, the implications are the same. In fact, they are rather well clearly stated here. But I think we can add something to the picture which will make it more valuable. The individual who is going nowhere generally has an easy trip. They say that, and there's an old saying, I think it's of Slavic origin, that no one throws stones under the feet of a person who is not going anywhere. The motion of the individual, when it is in conformity with his world, or with the general direction of collective opinion, is naturally the least arduous. He drifts. Of course, he may drift on the rocks. But even that will be an easy, gentle drift until the crash comes. The moment, however, the individual takes hold of his own destiny, the moment he decides that he's going to live according to inner conviction rather than according to outer policy, he goes against the general currents of his time. The problems are not any bigger than they were before, perhaps because problems around him do not change. He changes. But it is now a matter of value or importance to solve what was previously ignored, to accept what was previously disregarded or rejected, or to try to do things uh, more thoroughly, more honorably, more intelligently than had previously been the policy. This may all be assumed to mean that things get more difficult. But the karmic action is within the individual himself. Once he believes something thoroughly, he must live it. And this requires a planned life, 
a purposed life because the world around him does not share his common discoveries. Thus he cannot depend as much as he did before upon the support of the errors which once sustained him along with many others. He now must chart a course. He must learn more. He must study more. He must be more observing and more thoughtful. These experiences are generally regarded as bad luck because they make the person work. They make him feel and accept the responsibilities of his conduct more completely than ever before. So the karma of growth is the fact that the individual who really is dedicated to principles has to live them. And uh, what are the rewards of this? The rewards are far greater than the cost. Actually, there are no occasions in which spirituality, true spirituality, has ever come as a penalty. There is no case in which the person who is truly more and better can say that his improvement has gotten him into trouble. Well, what generally gets him into trouble is the opinion that he has improved, not supported by any adequate factual improvement, or the belief that the mere fact of growth is going to make it essential for him to be miserable. He can, of course, do a third job of it if he wants to. But actually, uh, all true development brings with it a compensation of larger living, happier adjustment, deeper understanding. And the individual would never sacrifice for one moment that which he has gained in order to regain the false values which he has lost. So the karma is simply very closely associated with the fact that the person who is following certain disciplines and has made certain conscious uh, declarations of intent must live them. And if he lives them, he gains and grows and is happy. But if he half lives them and half objects to them, then I suspect he could have a rather difficult time. But it is not the fact that nature is punishing him for growing. It's the fact that growth is demanding more than worried allegiance. It is demanding factual allegiance. Now, there is on the, in the third chapter here, there is a list of, of a method for grading, a self-analysis by which we recommend that the person estimate his own nature. I like this thought. It came a little, perhaps, at a time when psychologists were few and far between, and the average individual was not uh, of the opinion that he had to go under analysis to find out what was wrong with him. Unless he has really a serious psychic disturbance, and he may have, but unless it is a sincere and real one, he still does not need to go under analysis. Because until he loses his own internal sense of honesty as a result of tremendous psychic stress, he is still in the best condition of any living person to say what is wrong with him. He can say it, but he almost always only whispers it. <laughs> because he knows, but he hopes that no one else will find out. That is why we recommended in the beginning with this list of questions that you carefully answer all the questions and then destroy the list. Because if you think other people are going to read it, you probably won't answer it uh, quite as fairly. So we suggested here through a series of questions divided into headings uh, that each person grade his own disposition find out what is right and what is wrong with himself. Two cars are blocking a doctor? Well, if the friends who are blocking the car, the doctor has to get to the hospital, we better let him. 
it's possibly one of those, uh, shall we say, maternity cases. And those will not wait. They are like times and tides. The, um, these, this list is rather obvious. The purpose is to grade the individual according to his own honest belief as to his own ability in these matters. And there are various ways in which the grading can be done. Perhaps one of the simplest is to assume that 10 as a unit constitutes full and complete uh, maturity or development of a faculty or power. Therefore, if you put 10, it means that as far as you know, you are perfect. This number would therefore be used very sparingly by the wise. Of course, you can always compromise and make nine and a half with a, a moment of befitting modesty. But if you are down to five, it means you are half developed in that particular poli uh, quality, or down to one, that you are very poorly developed in that quality. Now, when you say, for instance, we take certain of these things, uh, continuity, perseverance, thoroughness, tranquility, discrimination, and inclusiveness. Now, one friend has asked us what we mean by inclusiveness. The others seem to be rather clear, but that one seemed to be worrying them a little bit. Inclusiveness, uh, in the sense that I intended it to be used here, signifies uh, the experience of the power to bring things into patterns without leaving things out. You know the old poem, I drew a circle and left him out? I believe Markham was responsible for the poem. And this idea of inclusiveness means, can you appreciate, can you accept, not through uh, dedicated allegiance, but can you acknowledge the right, value, and importance of things you know nothing about? or have never been concerned with, or have even felt were outside of your sphere of interest, or beneath your dignity, or things which you could say would not advance any of your own higher cultural projects. Inclusiveness means the ability to bring things together and to include everything, to sense, if not actually experience, the unities of knowledge, the unities of value, now, so that you will not be in the condition in which you will say, this line of activity is no good. That one is meaningless. This one is nothing but highly developed corruption. Uh, that gradually we take things in and find their total values. The more we can include, the more of God we can bring it to focus in our own lives. For there is nothing that exists that is not part of the divine power. And anything that we leave out is something of deity left waiting outside the door. Uh, about the time of this particular problem, there was a considerable amount of agitation due to the coming of certain foreign teachers of other races and nationalities and there were strong prejudices against these persons. And the answer to that is rather obvious, that at the time of the birth of Jesus, he was born of a despised people, considered as nothing and less than nothing, the least of the colonies of the Roman Empire, and a cause of nothing but dissension to Rome. Uh, he did not come of a great and fashionable party, but of a party left out. And anything that we leave out may, in truth, be the key to our own survival. So by inclusiveness, I mean this internal spiritual capacity to include everything, uh, to find a place for everything. And if we cannot use it at the moment, to very gently and reverently just kind of keep it in suspension until such time as we may need it, but never to cast away any form of knowledge, understanding, or any aspect of life or nature, lest in so doing we cast away with it the very seed of truth. The, then we have the emotional problems. 
And under that, there are personal harmony and control of appetites, control of affections, and so on. You can read the list. But the tenth one, again, has caused a little question. Control of the tendency to venerate. This, I think, is important. In Eastern philosophy, the disciple has much more tendency to venerate his teacher than there is in the West. But the danger that lies in veneration is the gradual and subtle increase of temporal authority over spiritual fact. To venerate means to most people to add too much of holiness to that which is not in its manifesting state totally holy. Uh, to venerate too much is to open the consciousness to terrible disillusionments. When we put people up on pedestals, they fall off. It is good for us to know uh, that the idea that Jesus taught is essentially true. No one is good but the Father. This is a very important thing. We may have kindly regards. We may have respect. We may feel a great obligation or gratitude. But it is a mistake to worship any living thing. And to venerate too highly is to violate the concept that thou shalt have no other gods before me. And there has been a lot of hero worship in religion which is not essentially good. It is worse for Western man than it is for Eastern man. Because Western man, less critical, may venerate less wisely. And in our way of life, we, we do often uh, overlook the human frailties of our associates, and in trying to enfold them in too much divinity, we make a very heavy burden for them and endanger ourselves. Therefore, the, the tendency to venerate should be under emotional control, so that it does not escape into a blind adoration, but becomes a simple appreciation, a simple respect, and a simple regard. If we can moderate this, then we are moderating an emotional excess that might otherwise get us into difficulty. I see that our time is up, so we'll have to continue next week, but we hope that this process and procedure will be of interest and help to you. Thank you very much.